your Bibles to the book of Genesis and Genesis chapter 6 this morning. <clears throat> so we're back in Genesis here with a quite a controversial passage actually. This is one of the passages that people struggle with. Uh, people find it difficult to understand. And I think the controversy is... Uh, compounded by the fact that we, we, we have precious little information about what was going on here, about what was happening before the flood. Uh, even though we might long to have it spelled out in more detail, it's not uh, actually, there's not that much detail here. So it can, be a, it can be a difficulty for people. But all of God's word is precious and useful for teaching us and training us in righteousness. So let's, uh, let's pray for clarity of mind as we approach the text together. May the Lord give us clarity of mind to understand his word. So I'll, I'll read it out and uh, let's, let's follow along together. Genesis 6, verse 1 to 4. When man began to multiply in the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. This is the word of the Lord. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards. So you'll, uh, you'll remember, hopefully, last time we are in Genesis, we finished up going through Genesis 5. We saw the, uh, the wonderful way that the events pointed us to Christ. You remember the, the names as men, we are given sorrow on earth. But Jesus, the blessed God, descended to earth, discipling his people and teaching us that his death would bring us his comfort and rest. So it's truly a wonderful picture of Christ. And we saw that the prophecy given by Enoch, if you remember, the one who walked with God, he, he said that his son, Methuselah, when he died, it would bring the judgment of God through the flood. And at the end of chapter 5, if you look back at uh, chapter 5, verse 32, we see Noah was 500 years old. And after that, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So you might wonder why it took, it took Noah so long to get married and have children. And it's very possible that because Noah knew about the prophecy that when his grandfather, Methuselah, would die... The judgment of God would come. Maybe he intentionally hadn't got married. Maybe he uh, didn't have children because he was worried. We're not too sure. But as we'll see today, it's, it's significant that Noah, during this time, was a preacher of righteousness. He was proclaiming to the world around him, testifying to them of the coming judgment. And so we'll get into that today. But first of all, as you look at the passage, you'll see... The appearance of these, these beings, the sons of God, in the text. Now, who are the sons of God here, who are having relations with the daughters of men? So throughout church history, there's been basically three views, three ideas about what it is. And uh, we'll cover them today. The first one is that the sons of God are the line of Seth. Like Seth uh, had, had his children. Um, he had Enosh, obviously, and then... Enosh had Kinan, and you follow through Mahalalal, and, and these were the ones who believed in God. These were the ones who were calling on God's name. They were the godly line of Seth. And then you've got Cain and his group, his, his family, and that's called the ungodly line of Cain. And so the idea here is, is that the line of Seth started to intermarry with the line of Cain. That's, that's been a, the most common idea throughout um, the Reformation, uh, Reformed churches. The second idea is that they could be mighty princes, these sons of God who married more than one wife and had a harem of, of people, of, of women. Or the third option is that it could be talking about fallen angels. Now, uh, today I'm going to argue for that third interpretation. I'm going to argue that it's actually talking about fallen angels. But it's quite important that before we look at this, that we remember this is an example of a question where ultimately the what you believe, which one of these three interpretations that you ultimately believe is not significant in your salvation. It's, it's ultimately 
relatively insignificant in your belief system because it's not part of the core of our Christian faith. There are things that we can believe or not believe, and we call them uh, adiophora, or things that are indifferent to our salvation. So you could believe any one of these three and still be a Christian and still go to heaven. There are some issues, of course, that uh, we, can't, we don't have so much freedom with, right? Things that are central to the Christian faith. Things that we might split the church over. If, some, if uh, someone had a difference of opinion about the Trinity, or that it was say, is Jesus God? If someone believed the wrong thing about that, oh, you're not a Christian. That's what, something we would divide over. That's something that's at the center of our faith. But any discussion about the Nephilim is not at the center of our faith. So quite important for us to understand that first. So most Reformed interpreters have taken the line of Seth view. They've, they've believed that it's talking about uh, godly men who came from Seth's family. And they intermingled, they intermarried with women from Cain's ungodly line. And the idea is that you've got these godly children who are following their senses, because it says they saw, they looked and saw, right, that the women were beautiful. They follow their senses and they, they married ungodly women. And that, in that, in that uh, line of thinking, the Nephilim who are mentioned here are just thought of as being mighty men, warriors, and somewhat unrelated to the sons of God. So, that, so the line of Seth view says, you've got Seth's godly uh, family, and then you've got these uh, Nephilim, and they're unrelated. Other Christian interpreters have assumed that the sons of God, or actually they, um, they say you could translate it sons of the gods, were actually kings or princes, just gathering harems of women. So both of those views are moving away from the idea that this is referring to angels. And one reason for this is because you remember what Jesus said about angels in Matthew 22, verse 30? He said this, At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. So the argument goes, angels don't get married in heaven, so therefore they cannot mate with human women. That's the way the argument goes. Just to push back on that idea for a second, we recognize that Jesus is talking about holy angels who are in heaven, that they don't get married. But the fact that there's no marriage amongst angels in heaven, it's actually led people to think, oh, maybe angels are sexless or genderless. But of course, if angels are genderless, then it's, it's safe for us to assume, okay, they don't reproduce. But you can't draw that conclusion from what Jesus says. You can't go that far. That's going beyond what he says. Actually, when angels show up in the scriptures, they always appear in the form of men. Always. They eat food. They seem to interact with the physical world like normal men. That's why when they, the two angels went down to Sodom and Gomorrah, remember that? And when they were there, the men of the city were ready to have, try and have sex with the angels because they presumed these are men. They said, bring those men out. That's, that's the way angels appear here on earth. In addition, there's several problems with the line of Seth view, which convinces me it's not the correct interpretation. One, one example is that you look back at verse 1. The word man here seems to be contrasted with the sons of God. Right? You've got throughout, throughout the Bible, you've got the sons of God. It always refers to angelic beings. You've got several references in Daniel and Job. And there seems to be a contrast here. You've got the daughters of mankind... And then you've got the sons of God. Not, not the daughters of Cain's line and then the sons of Seth's line. That doesn't seem to be the contrast. Another problem that shows up is if it were merely the sons of Seth who are marrying the daughters of Cain, then why would that result in mighty men or giants? Which is one way to translate the word Nephilim. We'll deal with that in a second. The question is, is how could a marriage between an unbeliever and a believer create some kind of new, powerful being, a man of renown? And why would God flood the earth because of this kind of marriage? I mean, if it's, we understand if it's the perversity of angels, fallen angels in humankind, okay, send the flood. But if we're just talking about mere mortals, it seems unusual. Another reason why I think it's talking about angels is because the New Testament has 
several passages that deal with this, this situation, and it seems to indicate that fallen angels were descending and partaking in these sins. The book of Jude, for example, talks about angels leaving their proper dwelling and being like Sodom and Gomorrah who indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire or strange flesh. We'll talk about that, that verse more in a minute. Jude 6 speaks about the angels being judged by God and bound with chains and judgment for the great day. You've also got 2 Peter chapter 2 talks about these angels who sinned and were cast down to hell. And they're mentioned in the same breath as as the ancient world and Noah and the fact that they were destroyed for sensuality and only Noah and his family were saved. There's also a passage in 1 Peter 3 talks about Christ making a proclamation to the imprisoned spirits who were disobedient during the days of the construction of the ark. So if these spirits are demons, then what it's saying is Jesus went to the abyss and proclaimed triumphantly his victory over fallen angels. Okay, so we'll look at it, we'll look into this more. You might wonder why fallen angels would look to corrupt the human bloodline. Why would they do that? And uh, the suggestion that's been made is, is maybe they were looking to come and pollute the line to stop the coming of the Messiah. Because remember, God had promised that the seed of the woman would come and crush Satan's head. And if, if the angels, if the demons can, can pollute the bloodline and the generations, then maybe they can prevent that. In contrast, Noah, when it talks about Noah, Noah's generations in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, it says, you can see it there in the text, Genesis 6, 9, says that he was perfect in his generations. He was blameless in his generations. As if to say... That he didn't have those imperfections that were affecting other people through the fallen angels. Another thing that this view has going for it, by the way, is that it is the, throughout church history, this is the traditional view. Almost all the church fathers held this view, including Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Clement of Alexandria, Origen as well. They all held this view that it was fallen angels. It's actually quite a new thing in church history to say that it wasn't. Now, ultimately, though, we need to be okay with saying, I'm not sure. Which one of those three is it? We need to be okay with saying, I'm not sure. We shouldn't jump on this as a hobby horse uh, at the expense of other doctrines like sanctification or following Christ. That would be a mistake to make a big thing out of a small, what what is it? Make make a mountain out of a molehill? It's not worth uh, making this into a, a central doctrine because it is not one. But you see, we move on to verse 3 here. The Lord says that his spirit will not abide in man forever. Your translation might say, my spirit will not strive with man forever. And this is, uh, there's two basic views when you look at this this phrase. Because a lot of this language is actually quite difficult to interpret and translate and then uh, figure out what it means. But there's basically two views. One group says, maybe God is limiting human lifespan for the rest of history. Maybe he's saying humankind is only going to be allowed to live up until 120 years old from now on. And if you actually take time to compare the lifespans before the flood and after the flood, you'll see there's a big drop off in, in lifespan. So you could, you could reach that conclusion. If you look at Noah down to Terah, you see the, the, the ages gradually get less and less. And uh, we've talked about that before, about why that might why that might be, possibly environmental reasons, a different atmosphere before the flood and after the flood. The second view is that God is saying, from this point on, I'm going to use Noah to preach righteousness and I'm going to strive with my, through the Spirit to preach repentance, to call people to faith, and I'm going to do it for 120 years and then the flood is coming. And I think that actually fits better with the context. I think that view... Uh, fits better with the narrative. So that would mean that Noah began to preach when he was 480 years old because we know that the flood came in his 600th year. So God's spirit was striving with these people through Noah in his preaching. Noah's preaching is is, uh, referred to several times in the New Testament. For example, 2 Peter says this, If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, 
when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So Noah was building the ark and he was proclaiming the righteousness of God. He was proclaiming to a people who were headed for judgment to turn, turn from sin. You know, that, that's quite a, a similar picture to our own situation. You know, we too have an ark of protection that's going to protect us from the coming judgment. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. He saves us from our sins. We too are calling out to the world, aren't we? Flee from the coming, the coming wrath. Flee from the judgment that is coming. Trust in Christ alone, the ark who will save us. The ministry of Noah is also mentioned in uh, Hebrews 11. By faith, Noah... Being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, by the construction of the ark, by this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So this is the pattern that we see established in the life of Noah. It shows up in the Bible everywhere. God, God appoints times and seasons for people to turn to him. And each time that faithful preaching of the gospel occurs, we can say, in a sense, that God's Spirit is striving with us to, bring, to call people to repentance. It's possible that the reference to Christ's preaching in 1 Peter is actually a reference to the preaching of Noah through the Spirit of Christ. Because 1 Peter 3 says that Lord, the Lord Jesus, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. You see, there it is again. So most interpreters take this group of passages talking about Noah's preaching to say that Noah preached righteousness through the power of Christ and in the spirit of Christ. And that the message of faith in Christ and repentance towards God is the same message that we preach through all generations. The ungodly men of Noah's time had a chance to trust in the salvation of the ark as God's spirit was striving with them for 120 years. Now God's spirit is also striving with us right now. God's spirit is striving with you right now. God's spirit is saying today is the day of salvation. There's a, a judgment coming. A fearsome judgment of the wrath of God. And today is the day to turn from our sin and to embrace the Lord Jesus as our risen Savior. We don't have forever. You, you don't have forever to turn to Christ. Today is the day. There will be a day when it will be too late for you to turn to Christ. And one thing is for sure. When it comes to the time that we have left, the season that God has given us, the length of opportunity to come to repentance, the Lord is sovereign over our lives and he has declared how many days we have. You know, David uh, spoke about that in, in Psalm 139 as a source of comfort. The fact that God has determined our days. The, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me. Of course, David's talking about when he was in his mother's womb. And uh, the Lord was knitting him together. This passage is obviously well known by those who advocate for life and not murdering babies. It's a, it's a very important psalm because it demonstrates that God is intentional in creating life in the womb of the mother. But you notice also that David is saying, celebrating, that his days were pre-written in advance before they began to exist. So God knows all our days. He can, uh, he can give a number. He can say, 120 years, my spirit will strive with you. And then, then the judgment will come. And I think we can glean from this passage here that God is patient and kind towards us. But there's a limit to his patience. There's a limit to his kindness. There's a limit to how long God will wait. He will not strive with us forever. And I wonder how many of us in this room have continually tested God's patience with us through our failure to repent and to be obedient to Him. And this verse seems to be a warning from God that ultimately judgment is coming and He will not be patient forever. There comes a time when God will write people off. There comes a time when He will proclaim judgment. 
We know, we know of instances in the Bible, like when he, he pronounced a cursing and, and blindness on Israel because of their continued disobedience. You remember Isaiah 6 and other passages where he, he said, you will be seeing but never perceiving. You'll, you will hear but you will not understand. Jesus did the same thing. He pronounced blindness and cursing, a, a curse on the, the, the leaders of Israel. Because they had not recognized his coming in Luke 19. He pronounced a blindness on them. You might think of other examples. But it's a fearful thing to fight against the grace of God who is calling us to repentance and to remain stubborn in our sin. You think about what God pronounced over Ephraim in the book of Hosea. This is a a fascinating passage. Just think about what this means here. Hosea 4, 16-17. Like a stubborn heifer... Like, a, like an ox, like a cow. Israel is stubborn. Can the Lord now feed them like a lamb in a broad pasture? Can, can God look after them and bless them when they're this stubborn? Ephraim is joined to idols. Leave him alone. This is God speaking. He's saying, it's a terrifying thought. He's saying, these people have reached a point in their stubbornness and their sinfulness where I will cease to strive with them. I will no longer lead them by the Spirit. I will proclaim judgment over them. Leave them alone. They're not listening. Let them go on not listening. Be ever hearing, but never perceiving. Can you imagine what a word of judgment coming? Whatever words of judgment spoken over a people that were more terrifying than this. Leave them alone. In the context of our local church, God gives us church discipline to deal with situations like this. He set up this system where, and Jesus called it the keys of the kingdom, because we're locking a door, or we're opening a door. And the church can act as the voice of Christ to call someone to repentance for sin. And if the individual member refuses to repent, then they are cut off. The key is used. They are cut off from the local fellowship. And Jesus said, let that person be to you, like a tax collector or a Gentile, someone who's unclean and an outsider. As God said, he's in idolatry, leave him alone. What a terrifying pointer to the surety of judgment that will fall on those who refuse to repent. And it's that this is what we see in our text today. And it's a reminder for us to, it's a call for us to repent. You see there then the appearance of the Nephilim, the n- in Hebrew, the nephi- Nephilim. It's um, interesting in, our, in the ESV, they translate it. Uh, they don't translate it, sorry. They transliterate it. They take the Hebrew word and they just put English letters to it. I wonder if your version says the same thing. You might have a version that says something else like giants. But translators generally, when they don't, really know what the word means they'll transliterate it they'll just take the sound Um, like they did that with the word baptism as well you know the word baptizo in greek just means immersion that's what it means to immerse something in water and actually before uh, some of the later translations came along the first english translation of the bible it said immersion instead of baptizo but then it was changed back to the word baptism interesting (coughs) But in this case, the Hebrew word nephal means to fall. So if you want to have a literal translation of the word nephilim, it should be the fallen ones. The ones who have descended from above. We, uh, we talked about that Jewish tradition, didn't we? When we we're talking about Jared, whose name means to descend. The ancient Jew- Jewish tradition that angels began to descend at that time and commit evil acts. But if you look at our uh, ancient versions of the Bible translated Nephilim, most of them were translated as giants. That was commonly the way this word was understood. And this is because of the context that the Nephilim show up in the other passages of the Bible, like Numbers 13, when the Israelites were preparing to go up and occupy the land of Canaan. Caleb had said, we can go, we can do it, we can occupy. But the other 12, the other Caleb and Joshua had said, we can do it. The other 10 spies, they gave a bad report. They said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, the land 
through which we have gone to spy it out, is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, so we seemed to them. You know, there's quite a big difference between a man and a grasshopper. It's quite a, quite a contrast in size. And some people, they, they look at that and they say, oh, these spies, you know, they were just afraid. They were exaggerating the size of these people. They were exaggerating how big the Nephilim were. But we have to remember the spies were not condemned for lying about the people in the land. They were condemn, condemned because they didn't have faith that God would help them to overcome the Nephilim. And in fact, there's another passage in the Bible that proves the impossibility of it being an exaggeration. The word, listen to the word of the Lord speaking through Amos. Thus says the Lord. So this is God speaking. It's not, it's not unbelieving spies. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and who was as strong as the oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also, it was I who brought you up from out of the land of Egypt and led you for 40 years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. Do you believe that God brought the people of Israel out of Egypt through the wilderness for 40 years? Do you believe he brought them into the land of Canaan? Then do you also believe that he is the one who destroyed the Amorite from before them? The one whose height was like the cedar tree. That's a high tree, very tall. And who was as strong as the oaks. Do you believe that part too? As you can see, it's not just the unfaithful spies who report about the Nephilim being giants. It's God himself referring to the extremely large size. You see, Jesus, uh, God calls them the Amorites here because uh, throughout the scriptures they are given different names throughout different times. So they're, sometimes they're called the Anakim, the sons of Anak. Sometimes they're called the Rephites or the Emim or the Zamzumim. There's all these different names for them. But they're always referred to as a people who are great and tall, like in Deuteronomy 9 verses 1 and 2, when the people say, who can stand up against these Anakites? So we're going to look at these mighty men of old uh, a bit more in a minute. But one question that comes up is, could there be Nephilim in our world today? Could, the, could there be angels coming down and mating with humans and creating six-fingered hybrid giants? And I'd say probably not, given that what Jude says about them uh, and what happened to them in the time of Noah. So this is from Jude. I mentioned this verse before. This is very important from the New Testament. I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, almost like a, 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 an idea of disrobing, they left their proper dwelling. He has kept these angels in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise just like the angels, likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, or literally went after strange flesh. You've got people in Sodom doing that, and you've got angels doing that. They serve as an example, of an, an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So Jude is telling us, I believe here, that the angels who fell have been bound with everlasting chains by the Lord Jesus Christ. That would mean that they cannot mate with human females today. Seems the most likely scenario. It is, of course, difficult to be certain, especially when you consider the fact that these mighty men of old, these men of renown, are known throughout history. Through the stories of practically every ancient culture, we have the stories of these giants. As the text says that, the angels came down before the flood and also afterwards. There are stories of the gods descending and mating with human women and giving birth to children. I'm sure you're familiar with many of these. Um, I've, as I've been doing research on this topic over the last uh, few months, 
preparing my, my own heart for going through Genesis 6, I saw that there's a lot of information to wade through. For example, did you know that in uh, America, there are literally dozens and dozens of articles from historical newspapers, especially in the, in the 1800s, that give reference to people make, digging things up and digging up giant bones, giant bones of humans. Now, in our day and age, we look back on them and we say, oh, they were digging up um, giant animal bones, like dinosaur bones or something like that. Um, most of these things are, are denied as hoaxes by contemporary scholarship. But of course, there is a tendency within secular scholarship just to deny anything that seems to prove the Bible right, right? Deny anything that uh, would disprove evolution. So unless you're an expert in the field, it's actually quite difficult to speak authoritatively to this either way. But there are plenty of recognized examples of giant warriors, both in the Bible and in secular history. There was a Roman uh, emperor called Maximinus Thrax. He is recorded by his contemporaries as having stood at 8.6 feet tall, which is about 2.62 meters. So about as high as that, uh, the top of the speaker there. And uh, his, the people said that he was extremely strong, strong enough to draw an ox cart by himself. Um, Josephus, who's a well-recognized uh, historian from ancient history, he wrote about uh, in, the, in the first century. He talked about a passage, in one passage, the Israelites were moving their camp to Hebron, and he says that the Jews encountered inhabitants of the land, including a race of giants who had bodies so large and countenances so entirely different from other men that they were surprising to the sight and terrible to the hearing. The bones of these men are still shown to this very day. So it was the first century. This is in the uh, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 5, Chapter 2, Paragraph 3, if you want to go look it up. But there are plenty of other examples of ancient writers recording finding large bones, and they give a testimony to this phenomenon. So this would include the Book of Enoch, which is a, a pseudepigraphal work. It wasn't written by Enoch. Um, it's actually quoted in Jude 14 and 15, interestingly enough, much like uh, Paul would quote from philosophers and non-biblical writings. So the book of Enoch is not inspired by God. It's not part of our canon, but it gives some really interesting uh, historical info about what the people believed. And they all believed the same story of the fallen angels and the hybrid race of giants. But even if you ignore the the examples outside the Bible, you just look at the biblical examples. We know that who's the most famous giant in the Bible? The kids know this. Goliath, yeah. Goliath of Gath, who carried armor that weighed about 57 kilograms. I wouldn't want to be walking around in armor carrying that weighed 57 kilograms. He had a massive spear that basically no one alive today could, could use and wield in battle. And uh, the Bible includes several examples of, uh, of where giants were destroyed by the Israelite army. The, the, the army came across a, a group of giants and destroyed them all. Like uh, Joshua 11 has a recording of this, if you want to look it up. Deuteronomy 3, 1 Samuel 17 as well. There's also the example of Og, king of Bashan, who is mentioned. And the Bible describes him as a giant that his bed was uh, 13.5 feet long or four, four meters long. So nowadays our beds are about two meters long because, uh, well, the biggest man's about, what, six, seven feet, so he can lie down. But Og, uh, the king of Bashan, was left of the remnant of the Rephaim. Behold, his bed was a bed of iron. Couldn't, uh, couldn't put him on a wooden bed because he must have been so heavy he'd go through it. Is, not, is it not the bed? Is it not in Rabbah of the Ammonites? So here's, here's Moses or possibly even Joshua, the time of Moses, the time of Joshua, writing, don't we have his bed? Don't, don't they have it in the, where the Ammonites are in Rabbah? Nine cubits was its length, four meters, and four cubits its breadth, according to the common cubit. So this bed that was still around in the time of, in the time of Moses and Joshua was double the, the size of a bed today. So you might imagine that instead of six feet tall, this guy stood at 12 feet tall, right? Which is higher than that part of the roof. So Og, descended from the Rephaim, as it says, was an example of the Nephilim. He was an ancient giant, a, man, a mighty man of renown. To be a man of renown means that you're famous because you're a great warrior, a fearsome warrior. There's two other examples in First Chronicles speaking about this guy Benaiah. 
It says that he struck down an Egyptian, a man of great stature, five cubits tall. The Egyptian had in his hand a spear like a weaver's beam. So five cubits is more than eight feet tall. That's pretty tall. And the fact that he could wield a spear like a weaver's beam means that he was extraordinarily strong. Another example in First Chronicles. Sibachai the Hushathite struck down Sippai, who was one of the descendants of the giants. And then uh, further down, the brother of Goliath was uh, called Lahmi, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. There was again a war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number. He also was descended from the giants. Now, there's, uh, there's plenty of other stories in ancient history about the giants, and a lot of them do mention the six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot, which is very interesting. When he taunted Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, David's brother, struck him down. These were descended from the giants in Gath. They fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So you can see that the Bible is not shy about recording the history of the Nephilim. The giants who existed before the flood and in the days afterwards as well. In our own day and age, we also see people who are very tall, but generally these people are tall because they have a genetic problem. You're familiar with the examples of people around the world who don't stop growing. It's called Marfan syndrome. It allows people to grow really tall, but generally be very sickly. They wouldn't be able to wield the big spears in battle like, like the giants from the Bible. It's also interesting to note that most ancient cultures have their own stories of the gods coming down and mating with human women and creating a hybrid race of giants. Some of the better known ones are the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is actually a hybrid. He's a, he's a, he's a half man, half uh, angel, half god, they call him, giant. It mentions the Anunnaki, the giants, in conjunction with the global flood, interestingly enough. And if you're familiar with Greek mythology... Who, who were the, uh, the Greek gods who came down and mated with human women? It was Zeus, right? Had uh, Hercules, remember? Half man, half god. Perseus, Achilles. You've got the ancient Egyptians. Interestingly, their stories of giants, they said the giants live in Canaan, in the land of Canaan. They, they, um, actually, the people, the, the folklore of the nations around Canaan is full of these references as well. So the peoples of the ancient world accepted the presence of giants as a fact of history. The Bible presents them as enemies of God who were destroyed by God's judgment or in battle with the Israelites. And so when you consider how widespread these stories are and how similar they are to, the, to each other, the themes that we see, is it really too much of a stretch for us to believe that these stories are actually reflecting an ancient reality which is explicitly stated in the Bible? Similarly, there are stories of the ancient flood as well in the, in the peoples surrounding Canaan and, and, and actually in every part of the world. I was reading about, a, there's, there's so much to read on this, on this topic if you're interested. Um, there's a really good book called Echoes of Ararat. Echoes of Ararat talks about 300 uh, flood legends just from the North American tribes. So you've got these other people on the other, people on the other side of the world. With all the, everyone shares the story. I mean, even... In my own work in Bible translation, I've come across legends uh, in, our, in our people group that were previously out, unknown outside the, their own people, but they paint the biblical story of the flood. These ancient legends often line up and often include the same elements that we see in the biblical story, like the boat that saved a small group of people or a bird being sent out to see if the water had receded. The Chinese language itself, actually, the word for boat is made up of several radicals that, that say eight people in a vessel. That's, that's the word boat. They use that today in, in Chinese. It's just amazing. The more you delve into this area of study, the more I think you'll find that, that humanity, we have a communal memory of, of ancient events, even events like Cain and Abel, even events like the confusion of language at Babel. There's, there's, a, there's a communal memory and even of the sons of God descending to earth and the woman giving birth to a hybrid race of mighty men of renown. Okay, now you might wonder, why have I lingered on this topic for so long? What is the point? What, why would God even tell us about these events that occurred before the great flood? Well, I think the reason 
One reason is so that we know that angels have descended to earth and fallen into sin. And these beings, the Nephilim, these fallen angels, are still causing chaos on earth. Now, we refer to them in our popular culture as demons, right? That's what we normally call them. And the, I think part of the importance of reading this section of Scripture is so that we would know that demons are real and that they do continue in their demonic activity today. They are often revealing themselves in the activity of psychics, so-called psychics, or astrologers, or clairvoyants, or mediums, or spiritists, or witchcraft, or other demonic activity which is common in our world today. Especially now that so many people have walked away from God and yet their spirits are crying out for something real. So many people today in our day and age, in our, in our nation, in Hamilton, are turning to this sort of thing, this demonic activity. You might have had your own experience in your life with this kind of phenomenon. You might know for yourself that there is definitely a reality behind these evil practices. And I think this passage helps us to know the reality behind it is evil. It is demonic. And as Christians, we need to know that this, all of that displeases God. We need to keep ourselves away from that kind of activity, have nothing to do with it. We are of Christ. We are of the light, the kingdom of light. We're called out of that kingdom of darkness. God has not given us... Well, this, this is also important. We should not be afraid of demons. We should not be afraid of Nephilim. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of self-control. We are in a spiritual battle and our, our weapons are spiritual. We're to put on the armor of God, the whole armor of God and stand against evil. We need to fasten on the belt of truth. Hold God's truth close to you and believe it. We are to put on the breastplate of righteousness, the righteousness of Christ that covers us, that makes us acceptable to God and the righteousness that we walk in. We are to put on the shoes of readiness of the gospel of peace. Be ready to proclaim the gospel to those around us, to give the hope of Christ. We are to put on the helmet of salvation to be assured that Christ is my righteousness and I have been saved. I will be with God in heaven. We are to put on the, the shield of faith and hold it up to extinguish the, the darts of the evil one that he sends towards us. We are to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which is why we spend so, so much time memorizing it as a, as a congregation. We are to recognize that Jesus has all authority on heaven and on earth, and he sends us out as his emissaries to exercise that authority over demonic forces. To proclaim the truth of God and to see those demons flee. If you're ever in a, in a, a situation where you, that you think you might be dealing with something demonic, it's actually quite easy to know whether it is demonic or not. When you proclaim the authority of Christ over that situation, if the demon flees, then it was demonic. If the person keeps you know, swearing at you, possibly not demonic, that person is possibly just not a very nice person. But we are to recognize God's authority, Christ's authority over all demonic forces here on earth. Just like the angels descended, Christ also descended and took on flesh to give us hope. He appeared on earth. He died and rose again to destroy the works of the devil. That's what the, the Bible tells us. So that we as his followers can live in the light and have victory over sin, Satan and death. So how can we conclude today? Well, I think when we read about the sons of God descending, marrying human women, uh, having a, a hybrid race of giants, it can make us fearful when we, when, we, when we think about Satan's power to disrupt the work of God. If Satan was trying to, trying to stop the Messiah being born, it can make us fearful. Wow, Satan can really work hard to disrupt the work of God. But we need to remember as well that God is completely sovereign and he's entirely in control over history and the direction that history takes. There is no victory against the Lord. We need to remember that. We need to follow Christ, the one who defeated Satan through his death and resurrection. Because he's the one who triumphed over principalities and powers. He's the one who broke the power of all demons. 
who are now required to flee from his people. So let us not fear. Let us trust in Christ and in the power of his resurrection as we look to spread the good news of his victory and as we call those around us to hope in the gospel. And may God bring a a blessing upon the meditation of his word this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we are thankful to you for the amazing work that you've done in Christ. Lord Jesus, that you descended and took on flesh. You became a man. You lived perfect righteousness here on earth. You gave up your own body to die on the cross for our sins. That you rose again in victory over sin, Satan and death. And now you have authority over all, all things in heaven and on earth. So Lord, help us to trust in the reality of your authority of your resurrection. Help us to proclaim your death until you come. Help us, Lord, as we go out into the world where the the power of the evil one, the prince of the power of the air, has, has blinded the hearts of unbelievers. And help us, Lord, as we go out with the light of truth, the gospel, to proclaim your, your, to make a proclamation of your gospel, Lord, with authority and to see people turn to Christ. Lord, please use us, Lord, use our church, Use us as individuals with our family members and our friends and our neighbors. And use us, Lord, to bring change to Hamilton, we pray. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.